We all know the names and faces of our state's most powerful elected officials, the ones who make decisions that affect almost 40 million Californians. But who are the people behind the scenes, the movers and shakers in state government? And with the new governor, who's up and who's down? We'll ask our guest, John Howard, the editor of Capital Weekly. BNSF Railway, moving our economy for 160 years. BNSF, the engine that connects us. Additional funding for the Maddie Report made possible by a grant from The Wonderful Company, harvesting health and happiness around the world. From the California Channel at the State Capitol and the Maddie Institute, it's the Maddie Report with Executive Director of the Maddie Institute, Mark Kepler. In any state capital, there are those key power brokers who work behind the scenes to get things done. Usually, they're only known to those people in the know. Our guest is John Howard, the editor of Capital Weekly. It's a well-read publication here at the state capital, and it's annually published, it's been doing it for the last 10 years, I guess, on California's top 10 power players. Yeah. Welcome back to the Matter Report. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Okay, so, you know, every year we go over this. Why do you uh, laugh every time you ask me about this? I know. <laughs> right. Okay. So, you know, every year we, we talk about this, sparks typically fly, uh, diverse reactions yeah. to your list every year. What did you hear this year? Uh, well, the first reaction I heard this year, which I've never heard before, was um, why don't you have more nonprofits on it? I thought that was that was good. That was a very good criticism. I, the California Endowment's not on it. California Budget and Research Project's not on it. Uh, they may be next year. They may be next year. <laughs> so I thought that was good. And, and the other reactions actually were not about the list per se. They were about the party we had afterwards, the reception. <laughs> so this is serious stuff. Yeah, that's like right. I said. That's yeah. right. That's for another show. Well, let me ask you this. Sure. So you acknowledge that your your research is somewhat subjective, um, but yes. you do research. I mean, you talk to a yes. lot of people. So how do you go about compiling this list? Uh, the people I talk to, most of them that I talk to, uh, I've known for a period of years, and I know that they know by virtue of their occupation or just by by other things they do that they know what's going on in the building. They know what's going on in the Capitol, and so. Really, I interview them more than anybody else. This year, I interviewed fewer of them. I think before we've done maybe 100, 120, maybe a bit more. Uh, this time, I think total was less than 60, maybe even fewer than that. Mm -hmm. And I think that was because there were fewer people who knew exactly what was happening with the incoming administration. And that's what most of the effort in this list this time was to figure out what's going on with Newsom inside the yeah, Who are the key, the key players? Who are the, the key players? Yeah. Administration, sure. Um, well, I imagine there are some people's names got dropped off the list. Um, some people were added. I'm guessing those that either got dropped off the list or weren't on the list to begin with uh, probably aren't thrilled. Uh, they felt they should have probably been on the list. So when they get that call, when you get that call, hey, why wasn't I on the list? What reasons do you give? Uh, I weasel that very carefully. <laughs> uh, a couple of people, I'll start out, a couple of people who were not on the list who had very good numbers last year. One was Eric Bauman. Another was uh, Joe Nunez. Joe Nunez, I think, was up in single digits. He was the top staff person at the CTA and just a couple, three California months ago. California Teachers Association. California Teachers Association. He was very uh, unceremoniously dumped. He Surprisingly. Was, yeah, very much a mm -hmm. surprise to to everybody that watches this stuff. Eric Bauman had a, some scandals. He had been made uh, Democratic Party chair. Before that, he was a power in the LA labor movement, had been for years. Both of them are not on the list, and that left some very big holes. Um, we try to have, we, we shoot for a churn, a turnover of a fifth of the list each or 20 names. Mm -hmm. uh, we just pick that number out of a, the air, basically. We just want it to have, be fresh. Each well, year. I mean, this year you had lots of opportunity to do that we with did. the new administration. And so that was the easiest thing, the hardest thing was the new administration. That's well, let right. me ask you about that. I mean, yeah. there's a lot of newcomers on the list. Yeah. Um, I've noticed, like, in the, we're looking at the top 10, but in even the top 25, there are fewer business and labor leaders, more administration officials. Um, it, like in the spots 10 to 25, just sure. very briefly, uh, by the way, it was interesting, you had a pretty good hint in what you were, where you were going with this. In the article you said, quote, deputy secretaries appear to be sprouting like mushrooms in the dark. <laughs> so well, lots of deputy secretaries. Like I said, we're serious. <laughs> That's right. So uh, tell us about some of those people that were maybe in the, from the uh, 10 to 25 range. Well, the first thing that happened there, I, I, I think if you're looking at 1 to 25 or maybe even 1 to 15 or 20, uh, the people closest to the governor in executive positions within the inner sanctum, within the horseshoe, we see that as sort of our, our primary ground. And then things spread out from there. But the, the people closest to the governor, 
uh, are the ones we look at first. And, and by so, the way, in, in the horseshoe, some of the insiders don't know what that term means. What does that in the horseshoe mean? It's just the uh, office suite here in the state capitol with the governor's office. It's like a C. It's like, it's like a horseshoe, yeah, right? It, you walk in, yeah, right? Yeah. So that's there for uh, the name. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, um, so we look at those people first. And the hardest thing about this list, I guess, as I mentioned, I'm, you know, trolling for sympathy here, right. but uh, was some of these names were unfamiliar to me. Mm -hmm. Some of them were newcomers coming from outside. Some were had been in there before and were switching around. So maybe a good example of that would be um, Keely Bossler, had before been a deputy cabinet secretary. She's now the state finance department mm -hmm. uh, director, which is a big deal. Mm -hmm. Even with, even with um, when you have a lot of dough. What right. Yeah, we, yeah. You think it'd be easier, that, but <laughs> you it, think it'd be a lot easier. But <laughs> uh, uh, Lenny uh, Mendoza uh, is uh, on Mendoza. Uh -huh. Mendoza. I'm sorry. Sure. In, in GoBiz is on this list. He's a, a valley yeah. person from uh, Turlock, I believe. Yeah. He's uh, ridge off a farm from the valley. Uh, he was co-chair of uh, or co-chairman of uh, California Forward yep. nonprofit reform group. Good government uh, group. Yep. McKinsey and Company, the big consultants. He's been global consultant forever. Mm -hmm. Really into business. He's got. I think he's senior business advisor, it's sort of an amorphous title, but he mm -hmm. does that for Gavin. Right. He's also, aside from being co-owner of a brewery down in the, on the coast, which mm -hmm. we thought was very important, which we mentioned, <laughs> uh, he's also the chair on the, on the high-speed rail. Right, right. So, so these are like, who wants to be chair of high-speed rail? He's wearing a lot of hats. You know, so. When up next, we're going to talk about the top 10 most influential behind-the-scenes players in state politics and government. That conversation in a moment. This is the Maddie Report. Welcome back. I'm Mark Kepler with the Maddie Institute. So who are the 10 most powerful players in state government? We're talking with John Howard, the editor of Capital Weekly, who publishes an annual list on the top behind-the-scenes players in California. So number 10 is Bill Devine. He's the mm -hmm. vice president at AT&T since 2006. Why is he on the list? One reason is he has the annual uh, Speaker's Cup down in <laughs> down oh. at, uh, Pebble Beach. That's a big fundraiser. It's a huge fundraiser. Uh, many, many, many people. I've never been invited, by the way. But uh, many people Neither go down I. there, and they have a great time. But it's it's a big fundraiser. It's a it's a big piece of capital culture. Uh, he does it all the time. AT and T, of course, has vast resources. There have been hearings involving bills that he's interested in, or AT and T is interested in, and they even hire other lobbyists to join their lobbying group. So they they're just everywhere. Yeah, they're a major donor in, in California major, politics. Yeah. So number nine is is someone that our our audience knows very well. That's Elaine Howes, the state auditor. She's very familiar on our program. We have her on quite a bit. Um, she checks up a little bit from last year. Uh, yeah. I think she was, uh, she's nine this year. She thinks she was 10 last year. She's always right there yeah. in the last few years. Before that, she was back a little bit, back, yeah. you, know, behind, you know, behind the top 25. But now, but she's we got like a spotlight. Her. We like her. Very good. Uh, that's what we have her on the program. Uh, but also, I should point out, she's also um, basically running the logistics of the, of the census. Yeah. which is huge. When voters approve the that... The Re Redistricting Commission. Redistricting Commission. Right. And that, a, a big piece of that is making sure the, the uh, commission is balanced, going through all the applications. Last I heard, they had over 4,000 applications. Right. The auditor is, to many people, surprised, but she's intimately associated with that and puts that whole thing yeah, together. Yeah, for some reason, they, they put it in her office. Yeah. But she does a lot of reports, um, yes. audits, of, of people that, whether or not they're doing the right thing. Yes. Um, University of California's had some yes. issues, others, <laughs> um, so she gets a spotlight. She does, and uh, she gets it in a way that uh, draws a lot of media coverage. R reporters on the natural, like, tension and conflict, and when she comes out with a report like she did spanking the University of California, mm -hmm. actually twice, spanking the, the handling of money and then spanking them again for not talking with her auditors, you know, in a right. straightforward way. I thought that was pretty good, so we're happy with her. Right, yeah, well, it's, it's, it's also the legislature, when the UC goes then to ask for money, that, that that's a concern if yes. they haven't uh, satisfied the auditor. Yeah. Uh, so uh, number eight is Alan Zarenberg, uh, mm -hmm. President and CEO of the California Chamber of Commerce. Interesting here, you know, it's a you know, conservative, uh, pro-business, mm -hmm. Republican kind of group, but very successful in California, oh, which yeah. is dominated by Democrats' yeah. uh, politics here. They have this thing called the job killers, yes. uh, mm -hmm. the bills they, they target. Yeah. Those bills usually don't survive. No. Uh, so Alan Zarenberg, tell me a little about him. That's a big, that's really one of the biggest reasons for him on the list. Another is that they do uh, a lot of campaign strategy work. They've tapped Democrats, they've tapped Republicans. Um, I think Marty Wilson is their main strategist on the political side. They're always in every important race in the state. Uh, I've actually asked a couple of people, maybe we can get rid of Alan Sarenberg on this list, and they go, everybody says, no, Democrats, Republicans, it's impossible. He's just part there of the a, institution here. Well, there was that fuel tax that uh, that conservatives wanted to see repealed, yeah. and that would normally would seem to be a, na a natural alliance with mm -hmm. the chamber, but in actuality, the chamber came out 
opposing yeah. the repeal of the tax. They yeah. wanted to keep the tax. Yeah, totally true. They saw that as a pro-business piece, I think, and uh, they were for that. Yeah, yeah. I, think that, I think you were saying in your article that they outspent, <laughs> when they get involved, right, they yeah. outspent the, re, the uh, pro-repeal forces <laughs> nine to one. Yeah. Uh, those are good odds. <laughs> those um, are good odds, very. <laughs> All right, so number seven is Ann P uh, Patterson. She's uh, Governor Newsom's deputy, here's another deputy, deputy yeah. legal affairs secretary. What's her background and what does she do for the governor? Um, she, the way I understand now, I do not know her, uh, and I talked to a number of people about, but she is the point person for Gavin Newsom on PG&E. He may have others that are involved in this as well, probably does, but she is involved in negotiating with PG&E dealing with PG&E, figuring out legislation or not that may affect PG&E. Um, she's kind of a big player here. Her, her, uh, she's married to, by the way, Nathan Barankin, who uh, uh, was chief of staff to Kamala Harris, came back here, and now he's at the office. He's also doing her campaign. He's doing campaign stuff. Well, it's Kamala. interesting because her background, like a lot of these people, she mm -hmm. worked for Governor Gray Davis when he was yep. lieutenant governor. She worked for Attorney General Bill Lockyer. Mm -hmm. uh, been around. Yeah. Uh, a lot of experience. These are all political folks, and you know, when you build your own political office, you get people who know the world and politics and know how to interact with it. And you feel more comfortable. I think, uh, you know, if you're a governor or a lieutenant governor, you feel more comfortable. Dealing I think, with I think when you see this, this one thing that kind of shouts out to me is experience. You know, it's not yeah. just you know what kind of degrees you have; it's experience in the state capitol and knowing your way around politics. But they look so young. That's what gets me. They look so young. <laughs> <laughs> to both of getting us. older, they're getting young. I guess both. You know. All right. Well, next the countdown continues. We're going to take a look at <laughs> positions six through four. That conversation in a moment. This is the Maddie Report. Welcome back. I'm Mark Kepler with the Maddie Institute. We're talking with Capital Weekly editor John Howard about the his annual top ten most powerful behind the scenes players in California politics and government. Uh, hey, a lot of people read this. This is this is a popular publication. <laughs> Isn't it one of your po most pop popular publications? It's almost the only one we do. We do one. Uh, we do one print edition each mm -hmm. year. It's a health care edition because mm -hmm. we have a couple of advertisers who actually like print. They don't want it any other way. So we do a health care edition in print. Yeah, I but think this one I'm guessing is, has been pretty popular. Oh yeah, this by far. Yeah. yeah. Uh, by the way, as, as I'm going to talk about the, the yeah. six to four. Before we do that, I'm going to ask you about: Do people use this? to kind of get to know the state capitol? Well, we've been told that. We've been told that um, there are offices in the capitol that tell their new employees, tell their staffers to use this list, you should know who these people are, that kind of thing. And we're very happy to, that's, that's great. That's and I've had some veterans say, uh, hey, there's some new names on this list I wasn't aware of. And I thought, that was, that's pretty cool. We are doing a real function here. Yeah, that, that's actually very, very valuable information. <laughs> uh, good, good, uh, good intelligence. Anyway, so number six we're going to talk about uh, is another member of the Newsom administration, newcomer to your top 10 list, uh, Anthony Williams, he's the governor's legislative secretary. Why is he on the list? The legislative secretary is the one who's responsible for coordinating all the, the legislation that the governor's office likes, dislikes, uh, wants to sign, wants to veto. Why did he, would he want to sign? Why would he veto? All this goes through the legislative secretary. And they're very important. They're a liaison to the building, to the Capitol. Um, that's important with any governor. That's especially important with Newsom, I think, in his first year. He wants to build, I think, my, my personal view is he wants to build, build a, uh, a campaign uh, resume, a political resume that when he goes uh, to run for president, not you heard it here first, but when he goes to run for president, say in 2024, he's got this solid record of achievement behind him yeah. and can use that. I think that's what's going on with him. You know, it's interesting, you know, uh, Governor Brown didn't really veto very many bills. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the, the thoughts was that his legislative secretary did such a good job mm -hmm. in letting sure the legislature know, hey, you need to change this, fix that, yeah. we'll accept this, we won't accept that, that by the time it got to his desk, it was a fait accompli. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and that's just good upfront work. Sure, yeah. And this guy's yeah. going to be the same thing. By the way, another one of these people who's been around the Capitol you know, mm -hmm. for some time. Um, he was, though, a lobbyist, I know what you, I noted here in your report, for Boeing for a while. So I guess that there's a revolving door oh, to yeah, some yeah. extent. There's, yeah, definitely. Okay, so number five on the list is Robbie Hunter. He's head of the state's Building, Construction, and Trades Council. That's the yeah. uh, council that works on behalf of construction trades unions. Um, he joins the top ten after a yeah. one-year absence. Uh, why is he on the list? Uh, well, he's been around. Um, and he was on last year, but he is, he's got a better number than he had last year, I think, because of the infrastructure advocacy he did, which uh, he was very successful at. Uh, he, they're into the, big... Prop 6 ga gasoline tax. Got it. And yeah. the commercial, com commercial construction, but also big infrastructure, you know, highways, right. uh, sewers, water projects, all, this is all his stuff. And he stands, in his membership stands, again, great 
a lot of jobs and do, they have a really a great uh, a great deal of work that they did on this. The guy really uh, he did the he did the deed this year. One of the issues I, I remember coming across talking to people, they thought should he be up? I mean, is building construction trades more significant now as a statewide player than the CTA? That's saying and something. That would be saying something. The California I mean, teachers are quite powerful. Yes, exactly. And SEIU is another union that's very powerful. Yes, of course. And yes. You're thinking that these guys are right, yeah. in, right in line with them. Yeah, I, I think so. And I think um, I, the list, I think when you look at it, seems to be heavily weighted towards labor. But California is changing each succeeding year, we seem to have more of an influence of, in, in terms of labor being able to choose candidates, vetting candidates, especially in L.A., but not just in L.A. Right. Um, the state's changing. I, I, I hope the list reflects some of that. Well, the, the council, you said, represents 160 unions and 350,000 members. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now, they don't tell their members how to vote, but they certainly no. probably suggest. Sure. You know, and they're so really into prevailing wage, right. So they're, which is essentially a union wage. And prevailing wage is... What exactly? Uh, that's the way. Th that is the equivalent of the union, the closest union wage in the area. Is and that my becomes the wage that they use for government contracts. Yes. And so a lot of a sure. lot of cities and, and counties kind of complain about complain yes. uh, prevailing wage. I think it, 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 it escalates. It increases the cost of those projects. Absolutely. I think San Diego is one of the big uh, opponents of that, or has been in the past. There are a lot of court cases involved. Right. And that that, so. that actually prevailing wage goes back to FDR in the 30s mm -hmm. uh, yeah. as a way to kind of increase wages for workers, um, kind of along the line with minimum minimum wage mm -hmm. and those kinds of things. It was one of those. Mm -hmm. uh, protective labor legislation concepts coming out of the New Deal. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so it goes back a ways. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Number four, uh, another newcomer, another key member of the Newsom administration, Senate Finance Director Keely Bossler. Uh, mm -hmm. What can you tell us about her? Well, she was on the list before. Last year, uh, under Brown, she was, I believe, Deputy Cabinet Secretary. I hope I have that title right. Uh, but she is now the new state director. She's the director of the State Department of Finance. In any year, uh, that's very important. The mm -hmm. finance department basically gives thumbs up or thumbs down on the agency's budgets. They're, that's the office you go to, I think in October, November, you go to them, you line up and hope for dough for right. your agency, for your and office. And that's been a pretty con pretty contentious office oh, uh, yeah. because we've had deficits. Absolutely. Now we have surpluses, so everything's good, yeah. right? It's, it's, it's actually contentious pretty much all the time, but when you have a lot of money, as we saw during, um, I guess during the bubble, the Gray Davis bubble, the mm -hmm. 1999, 2000, there was a lot of dough out there, and everybody was fighting for it, figuring, well, you got enough money, state, so I want my share. Right. Uh, when you're really in the dumps, when you've got a multi-billion dollar shortage, a deficit, People tend to know that you're going to have to tighten your belt. So there's, right. it, it so works actually both more, ways. maybe more contentious when they have a surplus. It's been my experience. Yeah, it's been like that. Okay. Yeah. Well, up next, we're going to talk about the three most influential behind-the-scenes people in California politics. That conversation in a moment. This is the Maddie Report. Welcome back. I'm Mark Helper with the Maddie Institute. We're talking with Capital Weekly editor John Howard about his top 100 list um, of the most powerful, influential players in California politics. Uh, we have a copy of it right there. I'm going to show our audience. Is that my cue for the shameless that, plug? Yeah, okay, you go ahead. You go. That's right. fine. Um, very interesting read. Um, we're gonna, not going to talk about the top 100. We're going to focus on the top 10. That's where our focus is. Okay. And we're closing in on number one. So right now, holding down the third most powerful slot in, in California state government for the second year in a row is Mary Nichols, yep. head of the California Air Resources Board. Why does she have such a high perch? Part of it is indirectly because uh, climate change, global warming, carbon emissions, uh, greenhouse gases, this is all within her bailiwick as uh, head of the ARB. That's part of it. But she's also a main player nationally in negotiating uh, climate protection regulations and they just finished and she was a, a huge part of negotiating with the car companies, several automobile manufacturers, agreeing with California to keep our emission standards. I, she, the deal was signed with four, and I think two more are coming. I right, thought I heard Mercedes. And, 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 and drawing the ire of the Trump administration. Yeah, and drawing the ire. Yeah, that was actually head to head. Uh, it's interesting that she has a role in setting, of course, our emission standards, but the Northeast looks to California for their emission standards as well. So she has a Tremendous influence, not only in California, but even outside the state. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think you said they call her the Queen of Green. <laughs> that's a good way to characterize it. Well, number two is a person that's been a fixture in state government politics for some years. The former yeah. finance director you mentioned earlier for both Governor Brown and Governor Schwarzenegger and yeah. someone who Governor Newsom has called a genius. Yeah. Anna Marisa Marisantos, mm -hmm. uh, Marisantos, who is Gov Governor Newsom's uh, new cabinet secretary, oversees the executive branch, uh, state agencies, chiefs, and acts as a key advisor to the governor on administering the state's vast bureaucracy. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about, about her. Well, um, the first thing about her from our perspective, from my perspective, was should she be number one or should she be number two? Wow. Uh, 
a uh, number of people said, you know, she's the make the, trun uh, the trains run on time kind of person. She knows capital inside and out. She knows, she's got a great sense of detail. She knows logistics. She's the kind of person that implements other people's visions, I think. I may have that stated that too baldly, but I, that's how I take it. Um, and so then the question was, well, is, she, is her position as cabinet secretary, is that a number two, or should she be number one on the list? And the bottom line, we thought she's got to be number two, and we'll get to the next person. But, but she basically herds the cats, right? I mean, yeah. She, as a cabinet secretary, she sits at the table where the, you know, uh, all the resources other, secretary, all, all the other ag secretary, sure, whatever it is, transportation and, and business, and all these people. So her job is basically to get them, to oversee them and to get them on, on focusing in the right direction yeah, on task. Um, yeah. So we're finally at number one, yeah. um, and this year's number one is the governor's chief of staff, Ann O'Leary. Um, not uncommon, frankly, for chiefs of staff to be in this kind of yeah. position, but um, tell us something about her. Well, first of all, I thought that um, that the number one person on the list should be the governor's chief of staff. Remember, this list is about unelected people. Right. So it's got to be a staff you know, person. No, Ann Gust was, was number one at one point. I That's think. right. And uh, she was not only not elected, she really didn't, I don't think she had an official position. Gov this is Governor Brown's wife. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but we thought the chief of staff should be the number one person on our list. It would, if it, unless there's some dramatic reason why not, mm -hmm. that person would be number one. Susan Kennedy was number one. We had Nancy McFadden. One, one year, Ann Gus Brown sort of bailed out a bit. Nancy McFadden stepped in and did her function. Uh, the top staff people closest to the governor have the top positions on the list. And right. so this time it was Anna O'Leary, who I do not know. She's got a really amazing background. She was co-director of the transition team for uh, for Hillary Clinton and Cain, that didn't work out. There was no transition, so <laughs> she came back here, got did some law work down in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. uh, she's worked with Tom Steyer's outfit, Nixon, before. Mm -hmm. um, she seemed like a pretty pretty easy call. Yeah. Um, well, let me ask you this. Yeah. You know, you were, we were talking earlier off camera about the number of new people on this list. You've got 22 yes. new people. Uh -huh. You said 40 of the 100 are now women. Yeah. I'm guessing that's really changed from 10 years ago when oh, we first started this yeah. list. First um, couple times we had the list, we got beat up that all the people on the list look like me, mm -hmm. um, or better, <laughs> and uh, and we didn't have we didn't reach out enough to women. We had didn't reach out to Los Angeles to Southern California. Mm -hmm. That was another hit on the list, which we thought was okay because we're an inside list. But right. a lot of what happens here is is driven by Los Angeles politics, Southern right. California politics. So we expanded that. We've gotten better over the years. One of the reactions you'd ask uh, you'd ask about reactions I didn't mention. At, at that reception, a person came up to me and said, how come there are not more people of color on this list? Mm -hmm. So we plead guilty. We try to fix that every year, deal with that every year. We, we do, I think, a better than we used to, but it's still a work in progress. So can you give us a little peek maybe into next year? Who's Who are the up-and-comers? You know, I, was that you that mentioned we should do the 50 up-and-comers? No, I did not mention that, Someone but I'll take credit that. for it. <laughs> that, wow, that's, that's a tough one. Uh, before I get to that, let me mention one thing. Who's not on the list, mm -hmm. okay? We've only got about 10 seconds, so very oh, quickly. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Well, we don't have Stu Resnick, the, the billionaire farmer. Right. We don't have Ron Burkle. We don't have Tom Steyer, who's been on the list before. For Republicans, we don't have Jim Brulte, and we don't have Cynthia, Cynthia Bryant on the list. So next year, yeah. am I going make, too long? Make a note of that. Make a note. They're on the list. <laughs> They're on the list. Is that good enough? We are, unfortunately, out of time. It's always a fascinating oh, conversation. Okay. Thank you very much for joining us. John Howard with the editor of Capital Weekly. If you want to stay current on politics, you can follow us from the Maddie Institute by just logging onto our website. I'm Mark Kepler with the Maddie Institute. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> the views expressed in the Maddie Report are those of the individuals participating in the program and do not necessarily reflect those of the California Channel or the Maddie Institute. If you'd like to share your thoughts about the points and opinions expressed on the Maddie Report, visit our website at maddieinstitute.org.